Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by my friend, Mr. Bill Ryder. Bill, welcome to the show. Hi, Bart. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to join you today. Yes. So this is a really unique one um, because you are a listener of the podcast. Um, and I'll say up front that you are a longtime drummer um, and you're a finance guy with Riverfront Investment Group. Um, and uh, you have done extensive research on Ludwig's role in the history of plastic drum heads, which we all know and love today. The Mylar, the plastic drum heads. It's obviously the norm, but that wasn't always the case. Uh, that was really, really new technology. And for folks that have listened to previous episodes about drum heads, which I've got a couple, there's the Remo episode with Herbie May. There's history of drum heads with uh, Ben O'Brien Smith. There's the Jeff Stern episode about calfskin heads. Um, I would say out of those Remo and Evans kind of episodes, this is kind of a hot button uh, topic <laughs> where people get a little uh, aggressive over, um, you know, who did it first. All that being said, you're bringing a new angle, which you have extensively researched about Ludwig. So you're bringing Ludwig into the picture here and a lot of other details, which you've you've sent me, which I have up over here. Um, so, Bill, let's dive in. And uh, well, first off, thank you so much for doing this and taking the time to create this and really researching it. Um, I think it's just awesome that you you put in that much work. Well, I, I loved your Remo and Evans drumhead episodes. I thought they were great. And um, I'm a big fan of Jeff Stern and his, his calfskin heads, too. Uh, I have I have a few of those and I, I highly recommend them. Um, cool. But as I was thinking about all that, I. I kept wondering, well, what about Ludwig? Um, I thought Ludwig plastic drum heads were great. I started out as a Ludwig drummer in the 60s and the 1970s. My first two drum, head, drum sets were Ludwigs. Hmm. I played on Ludwig heads most of the time. As far as their sound goes, I never thought they were any different from Remo's, especially in the 60s and the 70s. And occasionally, I found that the Ludwig heads would work better on some drums. For hmm. example, my Yamaha stainless steel snare drum worked better with a Ludwig rocker head on it than an ambassador due, really, to the slightly shallower collar Ludwig would mold into their heads. And for a long time, uh, Ludwig heads were widely used. From 1964 and into the 70s, no one sold more drums than Ludwig. And um, thus, no one sold more drum, drum heads than um, uh, uh, Ludwig did, too. They all came on Ludwig heads. Yeah. As the Ludwig's dominance started to fade around the seven, mid 70s, Remo became more and more popular. Most of the newer drum manufacturers were using Remo heads. For example, I bought a, a, a Fibe set in 1975, and I bought a Yamaha set in a uh, new Yamaha set in 1979. Both of those drum sets had their company logos on them, but it, it didn't take a Sherlock Holmes to look at the heads and go, oh, yeah, they're Remos. Yeah. Which there I want to I want to jump in and just say that like with with Ludwig, uh, it's interesting because I would have assumed that Ludwig was Ludwig was using Remo heads or something like that. But but it's it's not like that where these other companies would obviously kind of like, as they say, like white label, like a drum head yeah. where they slap their logo on it. Uh, that's not but that's not the case with Ludwig. It's It's interesting that they took the harder route of creating their own technology and um and 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 not just using yep another brand yeah ludwig's other problem was you can only get them in a ludwig music dealer store right mm. and there and ludwig in those days would just have one dealer per town meanwhile remo heads were in all the music stores sure now ludwig's main difference from remo heads was the way ludwig fastened the mylar to the flesh hoop ludwig used what they called a mechanical interlock system which they eventually uh, branded as headlock. And if I can describe that, uh, the outer flesh hoop was a J-shaped channel of aluminum, right? So after they got the mylar ready and molding the collar into the mylar, the edge of the mylar was wrapped around a smaller metal ring, which was inserted to the J-shaped flesh hoop, and then the outer flesh hoop was crimped around the square metal ring and the mylar, locking the head in. Ludwig guaranteed that the mylar would not pull out. And in my experience, no Ludwig head ever pulled out of the flesh hoop. Uh, however, the first 15 years or so of plastic heads, 
I saw heads that were attached to the flesh hoop by epoxy resin, the way Remo does it, and even uh, Evans, pull out of the flesh hoop a few times. Sometimes just the mylar would pull out. Once, I saw the whole channel of epoxy resin pull out of the aluminum flesh hoop. There was, there was just the frame left. Wow. I haven't seen anything like that uh, since the 70s. Remo's original resin formula uh, has changed a lot over the years, and they currently use different resins for various applications. Like uh, their very thick conga drum heads yep. have one type, and then their heads for world percussion have another. Yeah, and let's remind people that we're we're soon going to get into this more. Um, that really the the kind of universally accepted uh, uh, until I read actually what you have coming up uh, date would be about 1957. That was the you know the kind of like here's the day where we switched from calf skin or animal skin to to mylar um, with those with Remo and Evans and stuff. So the first 15 years, they're still really figuring out this technology. So for it to rip off um, that, I mean, drum heads in general, you think to the people playing, I remember my grandpa would talk about, you know, playing with the calfskin heads and, yeah. and it would be loosening. And that's why they used to have light bulbs and drums to heat them up. So, I mean, in general, drum heads had a lot of, uh, I don't want to call them problems, but quirks, quirks. <laughs> a lot of quirks. Which yep. were still getting figured out after the invention of the Mylar. It wasn't like an overnight thing. Um, oh, yeah. But that raises the question, because like I said, there's there's a lot of um, back and forth about who really, you know, was it Evans? Was it Remo? But that that raises the question, which you've you've you know, really nicely spelled out in your your outline, which I will f put in the description for this as much as I can, because there's a lot you have a lot of great info. But uh the question then is, who really deserves the credit for the plastic drum head? Chemical engineers. They deserve <laughs> the lion's share of credit for plastic yeah. drum heads. And if I may, I, I'd like to mention a few names because we shouldn't forget these guys. Um, lots of groundbreaking chemical engineering was going on in the 1920s and the 30s, especially with plastics. And building on the research of Wallace Carruthers at DuPont, a U.S. company. Mm -hmm. In the late 1920s and 30s, two British chemists, John Rex Winfield and James Tennant Dixon, patented polyethylene terephthalate, mm -hmm. also called PET. And that was in 1941, which was the basis of synthetic fibers. Winfield and Dixon then, along with some help, created the first polyester fiber called terylene, also in 1941. And that was first manufactured by Britain's Imperial Chemical Industry, or sometimes you'll see them referred to as ICI. Now, terylene was created as a substitute for cellulose film used by on, uh, Allied reconnaissance aircraft doing wartime surveillance work. The cellophane film was prone to breaking, which would ruin the whole mission. So Britain's War Department requested an all-out effort from the chemical engineers to create a movie film that would be impervious to heat and cold during reconnaissance flights. DuPont purchased the U.S. rights to terylene in 1945 for <laughs> further development. And DuPont's polyester research led to a whole range of tra uh, trademark products. Uh, the second polyester fiber was DuPont's Dacron, introduced in 1950. And then DuPont introduced Mylar in 1952. And uh, the surprise for me was, even at that time, 1952, DuPont stated that one of the applications could be as a drumhead. Wow. Um, hmm. In 1955, Eastman Kodak used Mylar as a support for photographic film and cameras, and then that was quickly adopted for motion picture film in the industry. Audio recording tape, that uses yeah. Mylar as a background. Weather balloons, and even spacesuits. Space suits, hmm. for goodness sake. Five layers of metallized mylar fiber uh, film were in NASA's spacesuits, made them uh, radiation resistant, and helped regulate temperature for the 1969 moon mission. Wow. I mean, that timeline that you mentioned just early on, obviously, when you hear something's being invented in 1941, yeah. it's for the war effort. I mean, so much innovation comes globally i mean we're talking in, in in britain and all over uh for that war effort and i remember seeing from one of those previous episodes doing a little research where it talks about um the uh the film for reconnaissance 
where it needs to be in the uh, the various the heat and the cold. And again, just so people can visualize it, that's because it's like a camera hanging on the bottom of an airplane yep. that would be uh, like a U2 or something like that, which would be like a reconnaissance plane. And for the history buffs out there, I'm sure that's probably a different era or something. What I mean, but you know what I mean? It's a reconnaissance oh, yeah. plane. Um, but very, very neat that that it, it all starts with that and then gets taken and then turned into drum heads and motion picture film and studio yeah. record like two inch tape and uh and spacesuits i mean so really the drum yeah. head uh you know uh inventing and, and moving forward with that technology kind of small potatoes when compared to the mission you know to the moon and things like yep. that but but every industry really uh gained a lot from that invention from these chemical oh, yeah. engineers who we're talking about. Well, the drumhead thing started with another chemical engineer by the name of Jim Irwin. Hmm. He worked for a, not DuPont, but three M, but you know, chemical engineers are like drummers, right? They talk. And, yeah. um, <laughs> yep. Jim, Jim Irwin was the first to use Mylar as a drumhead. He had started working with polyester film at three M in the mid 1940s. And around 1952 or 53, he went to see his brother's band at the Cafe Metropole in New York City. Mm -hmm. It's a famous old club. Yeah, yeah. Duke Ellington's former drummer, Sonny Greer, was playing in his brother's band. Sonny broke a drum head that night, and Jim, Jim told him that he thought he could make a head that wouldn't break. Wow. So Jim goes back to uh, Minnesota, made one up by serrating the edge of a piece of mylar so it could be bent around and attached to the flesh hoop of a calfskin head. He was kind of tucking it, right? Yeah, sure. So Jim takes it back to Sonny in New York, who uses it and uh, proclaims it's the best heavy head he ever played on. Wow. Now, Jim had no desire to commercially produce drum heads, but he did approach some of the major drum manufacturers with this idea. He was a chemical engineer. Hmm. Now, around 1953, a guy named Joe Grolamond at Selmer switched saxophone pad production to Mylar because of its moisture-resistant qualities. You know, saxophones are get all wet inside. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I didn't play them. No. Uh, and, and then <laughs> Joe started experimenting with Mylar for drum heads. His head was made by tacking polyester film to a flesh hoop. Now, Joe, who was also a drummer, was Ludwig's first advertising manager in the late 1920s, and then moved on to work for Selmer in 1930 as their advertising manager, eventually becoming Selmer's second president. He was quite a guy. He developed a mail campaign, which kept Selmer profitable throughout the Great Depression. While most companies were laying people off, Selmer more than doubled its staff in two years. Hmm. And in 1936, while other manufacturers were still selling to individual retail stores, Selmer, at Joe's insistence, switched to a policy of only selling wholesale. This is mm. welcomed by all the dealers. We still see it today. Boosted Selmer's sales significantly. Wow. And uh, final thing about J uh, Joe is in 1966, as he was president of Selmer, Joe offered to buy the Ludwig Drum Company in 66. Oh, wow. I know. Wow. It's crazy, right? Going back to the Sonny Greer thing, where it was, uh, it was 1952, correct? Right. Or 19 52, 53. 52, 53, which again is like five ish years, let's say five years before the kind of accepted uh, initial creation of the Mylar heads that, that Remo and Evans and stuff. So it really kind of throws a wrench in that, that uh, who, who did it first. Um, yeah. Which. Really goes back to that chemical engineer. Those guys did it first. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Yep. By the mid 1950s, though, Slingerland and Ludwig had both become interested in Mylar. Both of those companies showed it to Remo, but he said, and and they told Remo, we don't have the slightest idea what to do with this. And at the time, mid 1950s, Remo wished him luck, but wasn't interested at the time. So Joe Grolamond and Chick Evans sent Ludwig, the company, the first Mylar heads Ludwig's company had ever seen tacked or stapled to wood hoops. They were weatherproof and performed okay. well on a drum if you didn't over-tighten the heads, which caused the Mylar to pull away from the flesh hoop. So according to uh, Bill Ludwig Jr., who claims 
in his book that Jim Irwin, Joe Groland, Ludwig, and Slingerland had the idea of using Mylar before Evans. Joe suggested to Ludwig Jr. that they try to develop his idea, but Jr. wasn't convinced. And nothing really happened until Junior found out that someone else was going to show a Mylar head at a trade show. Then, according to Joe, a Junior got excited and got one together for the show. Now, jumping to the time frame you were speaking about, Bart, uh, Chick Evans filed his patent in 1956. And in March of 1957, he sent a letter announcing his new heads to dealers, including Drum City in California, which was half owned by Remo. But by early 1957, Remo, and this guy gets a lot of credit too, a chemist named Sam Muchnick, had developed the first version of a Mylar drum head that didn't tack to the flesh or staple to the flesh hoop. Back in the old days when those heads would pull out at the very edge of the Mylar, there are little holes all around the edge of the head. Have you ever seen that? I, I think so. I mean, and little and, holes. All yeah, around, yeah. Which, which was brilliant. On, on, on Remo and Sam's side, because it really anchored uh, the, the Mylar to the, to the uh, flesh hoop. Uh, Remo attended the Tri-State Music Festival in Oklahoma, where he showed his head to Ludwig Jr., among others. And Jr. told him, remember this is 57, that his company had been trying to create a plastic head as well. By June of 57, Remo incorporated the company was created to market their aluminum channel drum heads. And as you referred to, Ludwig became one of Remo's first OEM, original equipment manufacturer, customers. 1957, wow. with more to follow, including Slingerland. It's interesting. I know. Uh, now, according to William F. Ludwig Sr., I, I have an old booklet that he wrote about his, about his story. It's, it's a really neat little thing, but I was interested to see his comments. And According to Ludwig Sr., 1957 and 58 were the years of plastic de head development at Ludwig's drum company. Ludwig also tried tacking, stapling mylar onto the wood flush hoops. They tried hot and cold adhesives, chemical mixtures, all of which Ludwig found to be unreliable. Now, Ludwig Sr. visited Basel, Switzerland in 1958. He was... Uh, he had a big vacation. He visited his hometown in Germany, and he stopped by Basel, Switzerland, which uh, one of your great episodes a couple of months ago, uh, it's a huge drum center, right? Yeah, with Edith. That was a very exciting episode. Yeah, yeah. Um, while he was in Basel, Ludwig Sr. stops by the drum shop of Oscar Bauer, who was using Mylar to make 14-inch high-tension heads for the Basel drums. Bauer had a method for crimping the edge of the mylar onto the flesh hoop, but he never filed a patent for his design. Remo claims to have seen this dry crimp design before Ludwig Sr., and Remo said the design had its flaws because it wouldn't make a good-sounding two-ply drum head. So he passed on it. Mm. After Sr. comes back to the United States, Jr. finds his father in his office bending the long leg of a channeled aluminum hoop over an inner hoop in the channel, holding mylar with pliers, and um, came up with their version of that head. Ludwig got a patent on this process, which was immediately copied by Bud Slingerland, right? Um, and the debut of plastic heads for Ludwig and Slingerland was in the, both of their catalogs in 1960. So uh, that's, that's the first catalog where Ludwig and Slingerland uh, uh, advertised, promoted their own heads using this crimped method. So before that, a couple of years, they, so they did do the, the white label OEM kind of, uh, yes. you know, they used Remo heads for a little bit and then went to making their own, which, you know, now it's almost interesting that you, you, you don't think so much about a company like Ludwig nowadays coming out and saying, um, we're going to make new drum heads, but you have, you have companies like Zildjian who, become drumstick manufacturers kind of in the most in recent history, the last 10, 15, 20 years, whatever. So um, it's that's just an interesting parallel. I was thinking it was like, man, I can't imagine a company like Yamaha or whatever coming out with their own drum heads today. But that being <laughs> said, in like the stick realm and various things, people do do that. So it's not that outlandish. Um, no. And it was a it was a brave new world then, you know, of this new technology. So in in some alternate universe, 
Ludwig could still be making some of the best drum heads. And uh, you know what I mean? Like it could have gone yep. another way and they could have kept making them and, and been a major player. But um, it's interesting how that, how that worked out. Well, you'll see why in a little while that it didn't go that way for Ludwig. It could have. Yeah, sure. Ludwig ramped up quickly. They built a two-story standalone brick building on two cleared lots behind their factory on Damon Avenue to produce Mylar heads. Ludwig designed and mm -hmm. built 24 high-compression presses, which heated and formed the Mylar into drum heads of all sizes. And then by 1964, uh, the year of the Ringo, Ludwig doubled the size of their head-making facility, connected it to their main plant and standalone building next door. Peak production for Ludwig drumheads was like 3,000 a day. Whoa. And most importantly, to your point, Bart, their ability to fill their own drumhead needs at their Damon Avenue factory was a huge advantage for their production. In the old days, it was hard to find enough quality calfskin heads to mount on all the uh, drums they produced. So sometimes they'd have shells lying over it to the side until they were able to find the calfskin heads they needed. So this was a huge uh, production advantage for Ludwig, which helped him sell so many drums back in their golden days. Now, from from you being like a drummer in that 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 era, obviously, well before that was before my time. Were you as like a drummer aware at that time that you were playing Ludwig drum heads, or were you just? more these are just drum heads if that makes sense like like did were they really advertising that this is our own brand this is our own formula yes um i was aware of them and uh <laughs> this might be a whole nother episode someday but i we loved ca drum catalogs in those days they were like gold i would collect them from music stores and you know the music store i was their kid right yeah, so yeah. i wasn't walking in with hundreds of bucks so the music stores sometimes didn't want to just give them away, but I have a wonderful collection of drum head, I mean drum catalogs, and not uh, and I think I sent you the uh, some images. Yes. But in the 1962 catalog, Ludwig proudly showed what they were doing, that uh, mechanical interlock system, and touted it highly as superior to the other ways of doing it, including Remo and Evans. And yeah. as I said, uh, those. Those epoxy heads would pull out sometimes, and Ludwig wouldn't let you forget it, right? So um, the sound of the mylar itself, I don't, you know, I don't know. Yeah, you need to put a, a spectral analysis on that to sure. re to really make scientific claims. Yeah, you know, a lot of claims are made in the, uh, on acoustics of drums that uh, you know it sounds good, but yeah, you got any data on that for me? Besides, you know, someone's ears. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, that's come up in multiple episodes. Uh, like I remember Jeff Kirsch talked about it in his where it's it's the and so did Steel Turkington, where it's it's the buzzword uh, marketing buzzwords are very popular in drum marketing where I mean, we, we love hearing buzzwords. We love hearing about uh, sure. bearing, bearing edges and this and that. But so. Again, what you're saying, though, is just to really kind of like clarify everything is the the reason people you and other people really love these is the the crimping technology, because it's not like you said, plastic is plastic where that is what it is. But but it's the it's the technology that went into it that made it really uh, important in the history. Yeah. And people were slow to move to plastic heads at first in the early 60s and even later in the 60s you know my drum teachers who had been around for a while yeah they they were still using calf heads on their snare drums mm -hmm. those heads last a long time uh in schools my elementary school i mean they there were big plastic um calfskin heads on the bass drums and those sound great uh yeah so it it took a while for people to move over and um one of the things you worry about was the the head the mylar pulling out of the flesh hoop, and uh, for the epoxy heads, occasionally that was a problem. Mm -hmm. um, Ludwig's did they did not do that. Mm. Uh, I think I might have taken a set of uh, uh, pliers or something to an old head to take it apart just to see what they were doing, but no, uh, the Ludwig heads did not pull out. And um, you know, uh, as I said, my first two sets were Ludwig's, and of course the Ludwig heads came with them. So I was a happy user of those Ludwig heads. But they did take a while to get going. Uh, Ludwig Jr. 
what a, what a guy. I'm sorry I missed him. He did a terrific job of promoting these new heads in the early 60s. Uh, for example, during a drum and bugle contest that was halted by a big downpour, he straps on a parade drum, marches down the field playing his drum. The drum sounds just as good in one end zone as it did in the first end zone, right? People were amazed. Sometimes he'd show up to whatever and throw a snare drum into a vat of water, right? And, of course, everyone's aghast. So <laughs> Bill Ludwig Jr. pulls it out, wipes it down, and plays it. The head sounds like nothing ever happened. Yeah, uh, sometimes the guy would even drop a bowling ball four feet onto the plastic head. The ball would bounce back in his arms, and uh, the audiences loved it, but the head would get dished, right? Yeah, of course. So then Junior would pull out a hair curler and takes out the dent. Huh. We used to do that a lot years ago. Did you ever take out a dent of a plastic head with some heating device? No, but I've I've seen that happen in videos. I've never had a reason to do it and, and i've also seen the like how you can wipe them off with uh don't people use like vinegar or something to, to remove the like i remember at guitar yeah. center when i worked there people would do that but no but it's cool how you can do that with the um popping out of the dent Mock you your know? heads yeah yeah yep this episode is brought to you by dream symbols i want to talk a little bit about the dream symbols recycling program the recycling program is simple Bring your broken or unwanted symbols, all brands accepted, into your local dream dealer, and you can earn $1 for every inch of symbol you bring in towards the purchase of a new dream symbol. For example, bring in two 20-inch symbols for recycling and receive $40 off the price of a new dream symbol. It's that easy. They, in turn, take the symbols recycled and use them to create new products like the ReFX Crop Circles and the Naughty Saucers. Check them out online at dreamsymbols.com and follow them on social media at Dream Symbols. So marching drum units were really the biggest early adopters of the mylar heads. Ludwig invested heavily in heavy ply mylar, started eventually gluing two sheets together in what quickly became known as mylar parade heads. Mm. Slingerland came out with their own plastic heads soon after Ludwig's head hit the market. And there was no doubt Slingerland was copying the way the Ludwig heads were made. What, was it basically the same thing or would it be slightly yes. different? I mean, because they're famous for going in each other's garbage cans and pulling things out and reverse engineering. So it, it was the same thing. Here's what they did. Slingerland's Chicago factory w didn't have much success duplicating the Ludwig head. So Bud Slingerland takes the Ludwig head to a guy named William Connor, who owned a machine shop in Shelbyville, Tennessee, and asked him to copy it. Hmm. Around 1959, Slingerland started making about a thousand plastic heads a day, according to Connor, and he sold his shop to Slingerland, which called the company Solar. Hmm. Around 1962, Connor gets a visit from William F. Ludwig Sr. He comes to Connor's shop, tells Connor they shouldn't be making heads since he had a patent. Connor says he was aware of the patent but understood there were problems with the patent and believed he was in the clear. Connor said, you know, Mr. Ludwig Sr. was very nice and court polite, didn't, wasn't angry. But a month or so later, Connor was served with papers to appear in federal court. The case took about a year to come to trial. The trial lasted about five days. Bud Slingerland admitted to the court that he told his people to copy Ludwig's design but claimed the Ludwig patent was invalid because of prior art. Bud, uh, Bud Slingerland had heard the story that Ludwig Sr. had seen this type of drumhead in Switzerland a couple of years earlier, before Ludwig filed his patent. During the course of the trial, both Bud, uh, Bud Slingerland and Ludwig Jr. went to Switzerland, went to Oscar Bauer's shop, and were attempting to determine what had been seen, what had been discussed back in 1958. Mm. Statements were entered to the, for the trial in Zurich, Switzerland at the American consulate. The Nashville judge ultimately supported Bud Slingerland's claim that the patent should not have been issued because of prior art. So this, this whole mess cost Ludwig $180,000, which would be $1.6 in today's dollars. Wow. And that's when the mechanical interlock system became common property of the industry. Um, before I 
close the book on William Connor, uh, I wanted to tell you today, most drum companies, including those in Taiwan, Korea, and China, now supply drum heads with interlocking hoops. These crimped heads are cheaper than resin heads to produce because there are fewer steps needed in, during their production, and they don't require any specialty chemical processes or expertise. Hmm. Remo has a manufacturing facility in Taiwan simply because it's more cost-effective to be close to all those Asian drum makers. Yeah. Remo also makes crimped heads in the U.S. Jumping back for just a second to William Connor. Uh, sure. Connor thought the whole lawsuit between Ludwig and Slingelin could have been avoided if both sides had just agreed to share the technology. Let Ludwig's patent stand. Slingelin could have a licensing agreement. Everyone could be happy. But Bud Slingelin was determined to destroy the patent. Connor even says Slingerlin and Ludwig Jr. nearly came to blows during several negotiation temp- attempts. Wow. And as I was doing this research, Bart, I mean, one of, the, one of my favorite things about your podcast over the last few years is learning how much Ludwig and Slingerlin <laughs> hated each other. Yeah, very passionately. When we were talking about it before. Yeah. I mean, they were rummaging through each other's garbage yeah. to see uh, in the middle of the night, right? Yeah. Um. And it strikes me that fighting over drum heads really played a large role in starting this whole Ludwig Slingerland 50 year feud back in the 1920s, right? You got to remember the big drum companies were based in or near Chicago because Chicago was a big center for the cattle industry. Yep. All those ship, all those uh, cattle, lonesome dove, right? Coming up from the middle of the country, they wind up in the Chicago stockyards. Uh, And that's where the hides for calfskin heads were. Um, There were great variations in the quality of these skins, right? It took an experienced buyer, usually Ludwig Sr. or Henry Slingerland, Bud's dad, right? To go carefully look at the heads for imperfections like salt stains, scars, you know, backs, pinholes. So these drum companies, especially Slingerland and Ludwig, aggressively competed to be the first to the stockyards Mm. uh, when new shipments arrive. And they didn't like it when they were not first. That's because providing the the best calfskin heads was a major selling point for these drum companies and a source of pride for both Ludwig and Slingerland. Plus, uh, as I alluded to before, sometimes these drum companies couldn't get enough skins, enough good skins to finish their drums. So all of a sudden they have backlogs, right? They got yeah. shells all ready to go. You just need to put a head on it. Yeah. Which, uh, which basically though, what you said before about now Ludwig can have their own factory and, and supply their own drums with the heads is amazing. And, and I also want to just say too, so that, that hatred between Slingerland and um, Ludwig, like if they took this patent and like you said, if it went the other way where, um, Ludwig would have kept the patent and Slingerland would have just been able to license it or whatever. And if, if it didn't go the way it did, where the patent was like dissolved and, and then everyone could use this technology kind of in the open, um, that, that feud caused it. So no one can, no one can have the right to it. Now it opened up the floodgates to it just being free range. Just go ahead and use it as opposed to just these two companies. But they just could not work together. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I, this thought just struck me, Bart, but once again, my good education from the Drum History podcast, <laughs> if if Ludwig and Slingerland had behaved themselves, it might have put the kibosh on all those Japanese stencil yeah. drums that flooded our country in the late se- in the 70s or late 60s early 70s because True. they wouldn't have had those crimp the, had the availability of those crimped drum heads. Yeah. But once the patent was broken and it became common property of the industry, you know, Katie bar the doors. Yeah. We got a flood of Japanese stencil drums, which plays yeah. a large role in killing off Ludwig and Slingerland. Now, Ludwig kept at it for quite a while. Uh, in 1971, Ludwig expanded their drum headline by offering several more thicknesses and also that year, an attempt to differentiate themselves from Remo, uh, instead of using Mylar, Ludwig started using a film called Thermoline, hmm. which is in the catalog, you could see. Uh, this was the same type of polyester film as Mylar, but it wasn't produced by DuPont. My suspicion is they went back to ICI in Britain, right? 
mm-hmm. who, who had what, Terraline. Ludwig threw in an H in the name. So Lud- Ludwig was sourcing their, their Mylar or Thermaline from someone else. So they can say, well, we're different from Rima. Yeah. Ludwig said that thermaline was discovered in 1941. Yeah, it was. And then later developed and applied exclusively by Ludwig. This is advertising <laughs> talk to drumhead construction. Yes, so true. Well, that's, what are you going to do, right? Yeah. Uh, in 1973, Ludwig introduced their TI series of heads in which special treatment ooh, was applied <laughs> to the underside of the head to give it, and this is more advertising talk, uh, more tonal center and eliminate unwanted partials in the overtone series, which drummers would read as, yeah, get rid of the ringy stuff. Yes, yeah. This was also about the same time that, <laughs> what a coincidence, right? That Remo starts offering their black dot heads, which became popular early 70s. Uh, Ludwig's 1980 catalog introduced silver dot drum heads. Hmm. And then they expanded their lines and introduced heads for every kind of music, right? So they offered rockers, because by the 80s, we knew rock and roll was here to stay. Yes. Right? They offered striders for marching. They offered groovers for jazz and ensemble for concert. So they had four different lines of uh, drum heads. Groovers were actually the same as ensemble, so they, they were mostly gone in 1983. Rockers and striders? Those heads, those brands continued through 1998, but were then changed to Weathermasters hmm. because it was <laughs> because it was too expensive to make different boxes for every kind of head. Yeah, this is from Jim, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Jim Catalano, obviously. Which, yeah, yeah. Jim is great. I I hope one day he becomes my new best friend. <laughs> what a guy! <laughs> Me too. Um, he he was wonderful. So generous. Yeah. Uh, according to Jim. This was Ludwig, and this is this is how you should behave, right? Ludwig had a gentleman's agreement with Remo to sell silver dot heads without paying any licensing fees, and Remo exclusively sold black dot heads, white dot heads, and clear dot heads. Um, that's how you should behave, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's nice though that they could work together and not have yeah. it be some big argument where. There's never going to be just one company. That's what these I feel like Slingerland and Ludwig right. could not get past the uh, that feud where there's room. There's room for more than one drum company. Yeah. Jim, by the way, and, and it's in one of the catalog pictures I sent you, uh, came up with Ludwig's power collar heads. <laughs> That's a good, that name, a good too, name, right? Power collar. Yeah. And, and that used a self-adhesive black ring around the edge of the head, very similar to Remo's pinstripe yeah. head. And that first appeared in Ludwig's ca- catalog in 1994. Well, uh, we're getting to the end of our uh, story here. Slingerland stopped making drum heads completely in 1997 and then used Remo heads on their drums and also in their catalogs. Mm. Ludwig retired most of their drum heads in 2017, 2018, except for coated medium and heavies in common sizes. Uh, Jim thinks they might have tried to bring back some silver dots. Uh, we, we couldn't sure. really tell. Today, most drum Ludwig heads are made by Remo, except for Weathermaster medium coated snare drum heads uh, and Ludwig white timpani heads. So, um, wow. That's the end of the Ludwig plastic drumhead story. Unbelievable. And you know, what's surprising to me, um, I've read through what you, you sent. And the first thing that, that, that surprised me was 2017, 2018. I mean, they really, I mean, that's like, that's now, you know what I mean? That's not, uh, they stopped in 1992 or with Slingerland 1977. It's pretty wild that it went that long. My my question too, and I think you said this, but I just wanted to clarify who was catching up with who. Would Remo typically be the ones who first introduced like the black dot heads and then the pinstripe and Ludwig was kind of catching up and making their own version? Or was it they were both innovating separately and catching up? Or was Ludwig typically more doing what Remo was doing as far as that muffle, th- those types of different heads? Not, I'm not sure about that. Okay. Um, Lud, but I, f- I think Remo gets the credit for the black dots. In my memory, and I was around uh, 
playing different heads in those days. The Black Dot Heads uh, came with big fanfare in, oh, 1973-74. Ludwig had already started experimenting with uh, applying something to the underside of a head to to get rid of the, the high partials. Really, that's what you're trying to do. You want to get rid of those, you know, on the spectrum analyzer, all that stuff way over to the right that people go, oh, it's ringy, right? <laughs> and you want to em- emphasize <laughs> the fundamental tone of the drum. Yeah, yeah. So Ludwig was playing with some, you know, whatever. I don't remember that so much, and I didn't use them. Uh, you know, honestly, even to this day, Bart, just give me an ambassador. I don't want all that crap on the head. Yeah, I'm the same You know, same if way. I want crap on the head, I'll get, get some moon gel or get some duct tape but um, nothing tunes up more perfectly for me uh, than an ambassador. Yeah. And then, and then we'll see what we need to do with it. I mean, I think with, there are certain drum heads and drums where it's fun to experiment. And um, I've talked to some people about it on the show where there's so many variations of drum heads. It's sometimes cost prohibitive to be like, well, I'm going to try this bass drum head and this, then this bass drum head and then this one. And obviously you can change and buy different ones each time you break one. But I mean, a bass drum head could be 50 bucks where how many times are you changing yeah. it or or your different pinstripes or I'm the same way where I personally put on like an ambassador uh, and then I use a S- Aquarian, the super kick two on the bass drum. Um, but and Evans are great. I mean, they're uh, you're not going to get really a bad head nowadays. It's just preference. Uh, no, it's yeah, no. But if my memory is serving me correctly, and and you know, Bart, when we first started talking about this episode, I thought you could just wave a magic wand and, like Lazarus, make these old guys come back and tell us the real story. <laughs> yeah. So, but was, too many of them are gone. But if I'm remembering right, the black Remo's black dots were introduced first, and Ludwig pretty quickly responded with the silver dots. Yeah. So maybe during the 70s, there was some tension. And then they came up with what Jim Catalano said was the gentleman's agreement. Ludwig would just use silver and Remo could use all the other colors. Yeah. Yeah. And there's um, it, it's it's making me think of the um, Peisty episode with Dan Garza, where he talked about how Ludwig and they had the relationship with Peisty where they would license them and they were their biggest, you know, that's a huge deal. And then yep. it went away. And it's um. I mean, it is a business. There's a lot of like, I don't, I don't want to say hurt feelings, but there's a lot of you're, you're looking out for yourself and your own company. That's the most important thing to stay, uh, stay afloat, which, um, you mentioned to me on the phone and maybe we can talk about this in the bonus. Maybe, maybe we'll do something else, but about how these companies, cause you're a finance guy, they're not making millions and millions and millions of dollars like some other big corporations. They're like, let, let's say DuPont and 3M who were involved with the chemical stuff. Yeah. Those are mega giant corporations. These drum companies weren't, I mean, yes, they made a lot of money post Ringo. Ludwig was obviously doing very well, but um, they're still, they still had the, the need to be scrappy to some degree. Sure. Yeah. And you know, Ludwig, I think after Ringo was making, you know, a few million dollars a year in revenues, but yeah. you know, compared to large to GE or uh, AT and T, like pfft, it's chump chains. Yeah. It's nothing. Yeah, even if you gross those few million dollars up to today's dollars, you know, maybe it'd be twenty, thirty million bucks. But eh. um, yeah, which I think is uh, playing into the attractiveness of these small boutique drum companies. So many of them we see today. You featured a few of them. Sure. You know, they're. They're not, they're not becoming millionaires either, but they're making drums for the love of it. Uh, yeah. Meanwhile, you know, the, uh, old, the old big names have been assimilated into larger companies. And, uh, you know, you have quarterly statements, quarterly financial statements that yeah. you have to, uh, you were told, got to think about this. And, yeah. you know, you often get compensated on it. Yeah, yeah if you can increase rev- uh, profits by this much, uh, you you get to wet your beak too, <laughs> Mr. Manager of the drum company. Yeah, and and, and then it, it has to be said, I didn't think about this at all, but Ludwig and all these companies have been bought and sold and moved around by by a lot of companies where, you know, Khan or Summer or whoever, which, you know, I'm sure they're great people there and companies, but they may not have real might not have realized the nuances 
of this drum head technology or doing this. And they might have said, you know what? All right, cut it. We're, we're not doing this extra, you know, bits, especially after you spend that much money on a lawsuit that gets, you know, yeah. that doesn't go the way you want and actually goes the exact opposite. Yep. Um, so a lot of people to answer to. Yep. Man, Bill, this is just it's so cool to hear this entire story of all the Ludwig stuff. And uh, and again, having someone like you who has the passion to put it all together, which which I which I, uh, I I don't take for granted. I think it's awesome. But I do want to save some time here at the end to hear more about you as a drummer, because you've been playing. I mean, you are a lifelong gigging drummer and have quite the background. So uh, why don't you tell us about you and your background? Well, um, like a lot of your viewers, I I started playing before Ringo. Uh, I'd been playing a couple of years, but as soon as I saw him, I knew that's what I want to do. So yeah. that's all I would think about, and that's all I wanted to do. By the time I was a senior in high school, uh, we had a cute little band that played jazz songs and dance songs. So we got a gig at a local restaurant. They had just passed liquor by the drink here in Richmond. And uh, so we would play to kind of keep the diners around um, after they had dinner, they would dance a little bit. Um, mm. And, you know, for so many years, for a couple of decades, uh, I made a pretty good living playing nightclubs five, six nights a week. A um, yeah. couple of things kill, started to kill that off. Disco was one of them. Um, you know, mid-70s, uh, nightclub goers became fascinated with disco music, which was usually played by a DJ. It was hard for bands to duplicate a lot of that stuff because they were using the sure. big string sections and, and big production behind the disco. Um, and also, uh, in the early 90s, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, who, in, you know, I support their cause, but they killed the nightclub business, right? Uh, by the time that came along, at 1.30 when everyone was leaving the club, there were cops out on the street checking everybody. So that kind of put a kibosh on the nightclub business, um, yeah. which uh, that's, that's the way it had to be. Um, yeah, you're not pro drunk driving, but, <laughs> yeah. but it's like, but the, 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 the kind of residual effect from it. That's an interesting thing that it it affected people like that. Yeah, and it kind of like when talkies came along in the movie business, it kind of put an end to uh, being able to have a, a working musician career just playing nightclubs on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, studio wise, I told you earlier, I kind of fell into a studio gig in the mid seventies, and uh, that was really fun. And it took me. I'm. It's so happy they stuck with me because it took me about a year to figure out all the things you need to do in a studio that they don't necessarily teach you in music school. Your teacher doesn't yeah. teach you, but um, that worked great, you know, for 15, 20 years. But as the drum machines came along and stuff, uh, I could see uh, uh, making a living as a studio musician, especially a studio drummer, was getting more yeah. and more difficult, especially sure. if I wasn't in L.A. or um, New York City. Or Nashville. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I was very fortunate. The uh, the finance thing fell in my lap in 1991, and yeah. I did both for quite a while. It was really kind of cool. Um, but you know, playing live music, uh, even to this day, has opportunities have dwindled. Um, yeah, sure. And uh, I feel so bad for some of the kids coming up because you know, unless you become a big star. Uh, it's going to be tough to make a living, support a family, get health care yeah. benefits, uh, yeah. start a retirement plan. Um, it's so difficult for the young, young folks coming up, uh, much more so than it was you know, uh, in the 70s and 80s when, I was, uh, when my music career was peaking. Yeah, I mean that the the real life stuff of like you said health benefits and actually uh, when there's other mouths to feed it yeah. it's uh w which is just even more impressive when uh like I know some local Cincinnati drummers who who gig all the time and can and are doing it where they're but I guess it's just there's less meat on the bone um for yeah. for lots of drummers. And what I found uh even back when I was very active was you do a lot of stuff, right? I did uh, every theater show for the Mu Virginia Museum Theater uh, for more than 15 years. Every musical they did, and they did usually two a year, I was on that gig. And I had yeah. a ball. That was fun. And uh, I made pretty good money, and I was free to do studio work. So sure. um, I think a lot of your friends that are still making a living likely find themselves doing a variety of things, you know, oh, playing yeah. a 
a jazz casual here, playing a wedding there, and then, oh, I got a theater gig. Or <laughs> I, I once played for Rodney Dangerfield's show. Rodney mm. came to town. and uh, <laughs> That's awesome. He didn't carry a band. He just bo- booked three goofballs that stood behind him, played a couple of notes, and were the butt of several of his jokes. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> That's awesome. You know, is the anything for a buck drummer. Yeah, which you have to be. I mean, yeah. really, you have to be. Yeah, I made a good living um, at it at the time, but I, 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 it's hard, much harder these days. Well, I mean, but you've, it's just cool. You've got that background and that experience and you're, uh, you know, I've found with this podcast that a lot of people such as yourself are, are professionals. They have careers, but that doesn't mean that they don't have a ton of drums and they don't, don't still love playing. And now maybe they have more resources to buy more drums that <laughs> you don't, you don't grow out of it. That's for sure. No, and it, it ain't no up and coming mus- musician that goes to the music store and buys that 50,000 Paul Reed Smith guitar with the no. inlaid ivory. Yeah. They no. ain't buying that. No, um, no. And sometimes the folks who do buy those, it's kind of the famous, you know, the, the dad who buys the, ten thousand dollar noble and cooley kit who's played for a year because he can it's like well you maybe you shouldn't have bought that but uh but good 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 on everyone for playing the drums everyone's on their own um kind of path and all that stuff but um this is just i've learned so much and it's such a specific uh topic that i just i don't think like that's why i love doing this show is it's really transitioned into something where folks like you who who enjoy listening, which I can't tell you how much I appreciate, but you guys come up with these ideas that it's like, um, and I'll be honest, I get some people who say you should do an episode on some blank, very specific topic. And I go, yeah, I'll work on that. And I, I do, but like, where do I even begin? I mean, I can't put the energy and time that you put into this one episode into every episode. Um, so you did it. <laughs> you well, took thanks. the time to do it and you know yeah. uh, uh i i don't know if you want to include this but i i, I really enjoyed it i had a good time i i like history stuff so uh, maybe someday uh, you and me can come up with another project like this for me absolutely to you uh, open you you can do as much work and come back on as <laughs> whenever you want well, um, the, the drum yeah. thing was i was inspired because uh after you did jeff stern's episode i started thinking well We've never talked about Ludwig heads and they were huge in the sixties yeah. and the seventies. They were everywhere and huge. And, uh, and I loved them. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I was, you know, it's a labor of love. Yes. And, um, all right. So y- you got some help, which is going to kind of segue. We're going to do a little bonus episode like we do on the show for, um, Patreon. You got help from Jim Catalano, who was a longtime Ludwig guy, great friend of the podcast, and uh, and also Herbie May, who people might remember from being on the Remo episode, both of which yeah. uh, were very helpful. So we'll go into more detail on the bonus about how you put all this together and their help. But I know I can say personally, thank you to, to those guys for helping. And sure. I'm sure you obviously are greatly appreciative. I, I really enjoyed my time. They were both very generous with their time. I was on the phone for a couple of hours with both of them and some good follow-up emails and stuff. So uh, they're wonderful guys. And um, Jim, Jim just retired. Uh, and yep. uh, Herbie still is uh, the director of research and development for Remo. So wow. uh, he's a top cat there. And uh, <laughs> I was so pleased he took the time to talk to me and answer all my questions. Yeah, I mean, it's just we're all uh, I feel like we're all cut from the same cloth of like you can work at Remo or at Ludwig or like like and, and Jim's a teacher and, and and is a, you know, instructor. And but then at the end of the day, you can get all, you can get done working with drums and then have a three hour conversation on the phone about <laughs> drums outside yeah. of your job. Yeah. Which is kind of a special we're a special breed, you know? <laughs> yep. Cool. Well, um, Bill, I want to just say again, thank you so much for being here and taking the time to do this and uh, and and share your knowledge. And I look forward to your next, uh, you know, assignment that we'll send you out on to <laughs> to put together. So um, on that note, thank you for being here. And we can hop over and do the Patreon episode. And, and I'm, I'm very honored to have met you. You're a great guy. And, and thank you so much for all your time and <laughs> well, energy. You. My pleasure. It's an honor to be here. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning.